Welcome back to Cardades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with the last 10 days of the 100 Days of Logic. Here we are looking at predicate calculus. In this first video, we will be looking at the symbols and terms that we need to understand in order to use predicate calculus in order to understand the next videos we are going to be going into. Now, predicate calculus is, as we've said before, the marriage of propositional logic and categorical logic. Basically, what we're going to be doing is taking those categorical statements, those categorical syllogisms we've just learned about, and converting them into a form that we can use the rules that we learned about in propositional logic on. So we can use our rules of propositional logic to work with categorical statements and to get all of the force of validity out of those categorical statements that we can. Predicate calculus is also known as predicate logic which encompasses first order, second order, many sorted, and infinitary logic. Now, the first symbol we'll be looking at is using lowercase letters from the beginning of the alphabet. Basically, the only things we've used in propositional logic up to this point. These are going to represent objects, subjects, or individual constants. These are going to be things like proper nouns, proper names, names of places or people such as Paul, Quinn, Rita, or Sam. They are going to be specific objects, individual constants. Next up, we will also be using lowercase letters from the end of the alphabet. When I say end of the alphabet, these are going to be set aside to probably the last four or five letters in the alphabet. If any other letters are going to be used, there'll probably be some caveat or something pointing out that it's not one of these letters of just W, X, Y, and Z, because it's unlikely that you need more than that many variables in a statement. I've just given away what these are. These are going to be individual variables that don't reference a specific particular. The things we just had, the lowercase letters from the beginning of the alphabet, are those specific particulars. These variables could be any of those particulars. They're having that non-specific reference to any of those particulars. W could represent anything from Bill Clinton to the Rio Grande. We also have uppercase letters. These are going to be categories, predicates, relations, or predicate symbols. Basically, they're going to be things like, is an apple, is blue, is colorful, is delicate. That is going to be what these uppercase letters are going to represent. And they're going to each be paired, generally, with an object or a variable. If they're paired with an object, we're going to call them a statement. These statements look something like Pat is amiable, that would be AP. Quincy is beneficent, Rio is cool, or Samsung is devious. Statements are always going to take the form of the capital letter, the predicate coming first, and the subject, the lowercase letter, coming second. You're not going to have a statement if you have a variable involved. You're only going to have a statement if it's a predicate and a specific object. We're going to call it something else when there's a variable involved. We'll get there in a second. We're also going to have operations. We've learned about these before. Disjunction, conjunction, implication, negation, and equivalence. Check out those previous videos if you don't know what any of those are. We're going to be using a lot of them, so one would hope you know what they are. We're also going to be looking at quantifiers. These are kind of the new thing that is importantly being brought by predicate calculus that takes some of those ideas from categorical logic and brings them into a propositional form. The more important ones are going to be the upside down A and the backwards E. The upside down A is going to represent for all, so AX is going to be for all X. It's going to be known as the universal quantifier. And the backwards E is going to be the existential quantifier, and it's going to mean that there exists, so EX is there exists a Y. We're also going to have modal quantifiers that we're not going to get a chance to look at until we get into modal logic. That's going to be the square, which is going to mean it's necessary that. So that would be it's necessary that A. And the diamond, which is going to mean it's possible that. So that would be it's possible that B. 
as I said, the more important ones for now, and the ones you'll generally see more often are going to be the upside down a, which can also be represented as just x or just a variable in a single set of parentheses. I'm not going to do that so that it can be very specific of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about that quantifier, but you will often see it represented as that. We're also going to have quantified statements. A quantified statement is going to look like a quantifier out front for all x, and then a statement function, which we'll understand in a section, which is going to be just the predicate over a variable and another predicate and a variable. Basically, for all x, if x is an a, then x is a b. What does this really mean? Well, if a represented apples and b represented fruit, then if x is an apple, then x is a fruit for any possible x that exists out there. Generally, the predicates, the capital A and the capital B, are going to be the same letter as the first letter of whatever we're talking about, but not always. So this might be more appropriately AX implies FX for if something is an apple, then it must be a fruit, but it could be represented with a B. It'd just be important for us to note somewhere in the proof that we were using the B instead of an F to represent it. So that's going to be a quantified statement where you have the variable next to the capital letter in some form. It doesn't have to have an operation, but it can and a quantifier such as for all x or there exists an x out front. We also have statement functions. Statement functions are kind of the smaller part of a quantified statement. They're basically a quantified statement without that quantifier. They are statements with individual variables and no quantifier. The reason I took a look at these after the quantified statement is statement functions don't really have a meaning in absentia without a quantifier binding them. They have free variables because those variables aren't in some way bound by a quantifier. And so these statement functions aren't really going to have the same meaning as a quantified statement. They are, however, going to be really useful for us to work with and use the kind of rules of propositional logic on. We're also going to have script uppercase letters with lowercase letters from the beginning of the alphabet. These are going to be non-specific statements. Basically, what they're going to represent is that F, that script F, is going to represent all of the other part of a statement that's not the object, that's not the noun, that's not the specific lowercase letter and the A will represent that specific lowercase letter. So this would be a generic statement, something to do with that A, that specific thing. It could represent either of these examples we have at the bottom, as could GB, HC, or ID. As you'll notice, these are generally going to be the capital script letters, and they're going to generally start with F for function. You rarely will see more than one of these, and you'll only really see these when we're looking at kind of the definitions of some of the rules of inference we're going to learn along with predicate calculus. You also are going to have script uppercase letters with lowercase letters from the end of the alphabet, so with variables. These are going to be nonspecific statement functions. These are going to be things like AX implies BX, AX, and BX, AX, or BX. Remember, the script uppercase letter is representing everything that's not the variable, while the variable is just representing itself. It's representing that variable. If those last two were a little confusing, don't worry about them as much. As I said, we're only going to see them when we look at the definitions of the rules of inference, and they should become a lot clearer when we look at those definitions. Finally, we are going to have identity. Identity is going to be represented by an equal sign. It's kind of an operation. It kind of isn't. There's a lot that's going on there, and we'll cover all of that in our video on identity. That was the symbols and terms we're going to be looking at. There might be one or two more that we throw in as we go forward, but for the most part, that's going to be a comprehensive set of symbols and terms for predicate calculus. Next up, we'll be looking at universal and existential instantiation and generalization, change of quantifier rule,
conditional and indirect proofs, proving invalidity, relations and overlapping quantifiers, identity, modal logic, and final logic problems and some answers. Watch a new video every single day for 100 days here at carnadies.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.